Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. There are so many great ways to invest in real estate. We're going to talk about one today that maybe you haven't considered, but after today's show, you're going to want to. And we've got a great guest today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Are you ready to profit in paradise? Hi, it's Robert Helms. And if you think real estate investing meets tenants, toilets, and termites, think again. Located just a short plane ride from the U.S., a virtually untouched paradise awaits the beautiful country of Belize. When you go to Belize with the Real Estate Guys, you'll spend four fabulous days discovering one of the most intriguing real estate markets I've ever seen. With its jungle rainforests, pristine beaches, and 81-degree turquoise water, Belize is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Plus, it's considered one of the top seven tax havens in the world. Belize property is on the rise, and many experts think the best is yet to come. But don't just take my word for it. Come experience Belize firsthand at our upcoming investor field trip. When you join us, you'll discover the many reasons we love Belize, like tremendously undervalued beachfront land, super low taxes, ease of doing business, and so much more. Get the details at realestateguysradio.com. Just click on events. See paradise for yourself. Click events at realestateguysradio.com, and I'll see you in beautiful Belize. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys Radio Show. I'm your host, Robert Helms, with me as usual, financial strategist, co-host, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, we travel around and look for great opportunities and great places to celebrate. And everywhere we go, there seems to be real estate. Yeah, well, and that's because real estate's all over the world. That's right. In fact, it is the world. And, you know, most in real estate investors think, well, I grew up in a house, and I could buy a house, and then I could rent it out. And that's awesome. Right? Most of the people that listen to our show invest in residential real estate, whether it's single-family homes or apartments. Someone lives there, mobile home parks, right? It's a place that I can help house America and get paid for it, which is awesome. Of course, there's other ways to invest in real estate. We talk about land investments. We talk about investments that come out of the ground, like precious metals and oil and gas. And one of the things we've been focusing on for the last few years is really getting our mind around investing in dirt and turning it to dollars, agricultural real estate. Yeah, this one's huge. You know, if you really think about it, we talk a lot about some of the concerns that people, I think, should be paying attention to what's going on globally. Uh, you look at the high levels of debt and the uh, instability of some of the financial systems, and some people would say even the unsustainability of certain financial ecosystems that our investments float in. You look at people like the Chinese that have been gobbling up natural resources all around the world in anticipation of having a huge population. Chris Martinson on the summit talked about how the world is growing in population and consumption of resources, and we are a finite planet, which means at some point, those resources are going to become ever more valuable as there's more and more competition for limited amounts of resources. People who are taking the long view, and the Chinese are famous for long view, is they're acquiring these resources. Well, as an investor, you know, we have that part of our portfolio. Maybe we're wholesaling or flipping, and maybe we're in and out in a year. We make a little bit of quick cash. Okay, maybe things we're going to hold for three to five years, maybe a development project, something like that. We may have a, a property that we plan to hold for 10 or 20 years. Jim Rickards, in his book, Currency Wars and also in The Death of Money, he talks about the importance of protecting your wealth against the collapse of a currency. And one of the areas he recommends is land. And a lot of times people come to us, well, the problem with owning land is that it doesn't cash flow. There's no yield. Yeah, and that's a problem. And so agriculture gives you the opportunity to own raw land that, in fact, will cash flow. Think of it like you have an opportunity to buy a corner lot in a suburban area somewhere, and it's an area that hasn't really grown yet. And you think, well, I mean, it's just sitting there, but could you rent out a pumpkin patch during Halloween? Could you uh, rent out a Christmas tree farm, you know, during the holidays? Could you find ways to put advertising or something on it as a way to generate a little bit of cash flow while you're waiting for the true value. And of course, in the case of agriculture, a lot of times the true value actually is the agriculture. What's great is, is the land has some value for sure, but it's really the renewability, the sustainability, the income stream. Mining, you pull something out of the ground, and when that resource is gone, it's gone. Whereas you look at something like agriculture, and if it's done properly, then you have season after season after season of income coming in from the crops. Well, I think the critical phrase there is if it's done properly. Because, you know, you look at, at agriculture and go, yeah, well, we're on a calorie crunch. We're going to need more calories in the future than we need now. People are going to consume all kinds of things, and there's going to be an absolute demand. 
And what does the supply chain look like? You hear about these farmers that get subsidized to not grow things, and it's like, well, how can that make sense? That's not providing calories. Well, it's a political conversation, one outside the scope of today's show. But if you start to look at it to where does the money actually come from, these renewable resources can be great. The challenge is if all you've ever invested is in real estate, you know, from a residential point of view or commercial point of view, you haven't thought about agriculture, there's so many other things to learn. I mean, there's soils and how to pick the right type of property, and there's irrigation, and there's weather, and there's the growth, and what are you growing, what are crop, and there's just so many things to think about that I think that is kind of the first hurdle in agricultural investing. Sure. Well, it's like any other niche. You have to learn your niche. It's different investing in mobile home parks than apartment buildings or assisted living facilities or medical office buildings. You have to understand your demographic. You have to understand where the income is coming from. What industries are you dependent upon? I mean, it's it's not complicated from that standpoint, but it is different, and you just need to take the time to get educated. I well, think I think it's more than that, too. It's not just the educated part. It's the fact that economy of scale works like this in residential. I can buy a single house, a single condo, a single townhouse, or a duplex or fourplex, and I can manage myself if I chose to work and hire a property manager. Pretty clear-cut way to do that. Lots of property managers around. As soon as you talk about farming or growing something, that's a big, big scale. Hard to make any profit planting an acre of carrots. Right. I mean, it really takes scale, which means productions and logistics and, and farmers and employees and science and wow. Easy to go, you know what, forget it, I'll buy a house. But there's opportunity today to come alongside people who are already in that space, already producing profit, already know what they're doing, and partner. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's no different than syndication. A lot of people come in and they think they start want to start with single-family homes because they can figure out how to do that. I can come up with twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars down. I can go get a loan for a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand, and own my first income property. Then there's other people that come along and go, you know what? I can go buy an apartment building right now just by syndicating and doing a deal with other partners. And it's the same thing. Anything can be syndicated. And it doesn't necessarily have to be you're investing directly in the same deal. I mean, if you decided you wanted to buy a city block because there was some strategic reason to do that, an assemblage product of some kind, maybe you decided you looked at the long-term plan and there's a bunch of little houses here, but someday it's going to be a high-rise or someday it could be a casino or something. Someday it'll be AT&T Stadium. Yeah, so you say to yourself, okay, I'm going to go buy this, but I can't afford to buy it. So you get together 20 of your friends or 30 of your friends, and they each buy two properties, and you each individually own your very own individual property, but you're all part of a bigger program. And later on, you guys know what you're doing, and this is going to be an exit strategy where you can hold on to the land until you're going to do with it what you're going to do. Now, I'm not saying that that is the way you know you would approach agriculture, but I'm saying it's possible to go in alongside other, other people. One of the other things uh, about the whole concept of, of agricultural investing is to think about what goes on in a place like the United States. I grew up in Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley. I grew up when it was Santa Clara Valley. And there were fruit orchards and fruit drying operations. Mariani's was there, I remember, on the corner of Stevens Creek Boulevard and what is now De Anza Boulevard. That all changed because as more and more population and more and more industry grew, all that farmland got bought up and it went away, never to be replanted again. But the need for the produce it created did not go away. So what happened? Those farmers went someplace else. Well, that's going on all around the world right now. We say all the time, live where you want to live and invest where the numbers make sense. And so when you look at farmland, you may be looking around going, there's no farmland where I live. Right. Well, of course not. You have to look around the globe and say, where is the farmland? Where's the natural place for farmland? Where do crops grow best? Certain crops grow better in certain climates. And then you have to say, well, what is the demand around the world for different types of produce or agricultural commodities, if you will? That's something that you can begin to think about, too. It's strategic. You don't have to get it right based on the local economy. You have to get it right based on the demand globally for the right commodity and then the right conditions to grow that particular commodity. So it's a little bit different the way you think about it, but conceptually it's, it's the same. The patterns and the principles of being a good investor in any asset class are the same. In the last several years, we've had lots of our listeners get interested and, in fact, invest in these very types of investments. We're excited today to talk about agricultural real estate. Uh, more when we come back, you're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Hess. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. 
Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation. And our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid-South Homebuyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A-plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. If you love turnkey cash flowing real estate, then Indianapolis is your market. Forbes just rated it the number one market for renters. As real estate investors, we love renters. Find out if Indianapolis is the right market for you. Get a copy of Aaron Adams' Indianapolis Market Report by sending an email to indy at realestateguysradio.com. That's indy, I-N-D-Y, at realestateguysradio.com. Hey, it's Ken McElroy. I listen to the Real Estate Guys and so should you. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning in to the show today. We love to talk real estate, and not everyone is interested in agricultural real estate, but I'm guessing by the end of this show we'll have more folks that are. Please welcome... Back to the Real Estate Guys radio show, our good friend Alex Wilson. How are you? Hey, I'm well, Robert. How are you today? I'm great. It's great to have you back on the show. Last time we had you on, I uh, think we talked about uh, wood and timber and hardwood. And today, we're going to talk about a different type of agriculture, and that is coconuts. Tell us about coconuts, Alex. Well, you know, that's a, a crazy commodity, really. But, you know, if you've watched what's happened in the space over the last 15 to 20 years, it's gone from being virtually a niche product. I remember... As a kid at my grandma's, coconut macaroons. Right. I mean, you know, you love the coconut uh, sort of sprinkles on the top of the cake and the coconut ice cream and things like that. But I, um, I've watched it, and um, over the last 10 or 15 years, it started to show up in, in places, and, uh, and especially in my kitchen, my wife's kitchen. Uh, first it was coconut milk, and then it was coconut sort of cooking oil, and then it was upstairs in the bathroom with my girls, coconut shampoo, coconut cream on their face. And as you know, we're in the wood business. Um, about six or seven years ago, we got a call from a Dominican Republic commodity uh, exporter looking for coconuts that were grown in Central America. Now, my business partner's, uh, his father-in-law, I should say, has some coconut trees growing on his little farm. Not very many, a half a dozen trees. And we see those coconuts come off and they get taken down to the marketplace. But the gentleman that called me was looking for a container load of coconuts every single week. And so I asked a simple question. What in the world would you do with a, you know, a container load every week? He said, well, if you've not watched recently, you were telling me about you know, the grandma story, but how about all of the different uncorrelated products that coconuts are, are used today? So let's just take a look at some of those things, starting with pet foods. Yeah, they have pet foods, coconut-flavored pet foods. They have biofuels. They have activated carbon. Activated carbon is, of course, used for filtration of water and from the shell of the coconut. We've got things like, obviously, a, a lot of the food products, but the one that really sort of catapulted coconuts into the mainstream media, if you will, is the water, coconut water, for all of the reasons, you know, the, the hydration and all of that stuff. And I think it was two young fellas from New Jersey that, um, it's a crazy story. Uh, they had, uh, one of them had a, a girlfriend in Brazil, and um, she was in New York and New Jersey staying for a week or two, and she uh, was kind of, hey, I'm missing my coconut water, and he went back with her to a home country and had a brainwave. Maybe Americans will drink coconut water. Well, that's only, that's like 8 to 10, 12 years ago, and here they are today, a multi-billion dollar company. And actually, I read yesterday that they're looking and they're shopping to sell the company for as much as a billion dollars. So here we are with a, a commodity that 15 years ago maybe wasn't used that much, but today hundreds and hundreds of different applications for it. So it's become a global commodity. And you guys have been doing it for a little while now. And obviously, being in the lumber and tree business, you understand that part of it very well. But what's different about coconuts is they grow pretty quickly. They do, and we made the decision to try. You know, we've been looking. We live, we, we, we work and live right there in the Central American tropics, right across, just across the Costa Rican border in Nicaragua. And so it doesn't matter which road you drive on. 
somebody's growing something. It's very fertile soil, so it's very volcanic. So Nicaragua sits on the sixth largest freshwater aquifer on Earth, so it's got all of the water you need under the ground. Of course, you get 300 inches of rain, too. So you drive up and down those roads, and you see plantains, and you see sugar, and you see mangoes, and you see limes, and you just see everything. And the call that I got was kind of fascinating to me. It's like, you know, I don't see many coconuts grown down here. So Ken and I purchased a few trees just to try, and they just took off and they did their thing. We made the decision that, hey, this would probably be something that we would enjoy diversifying into. Right. Timber's pretty stable. It's pretty strong. I mean, trees rarely, I mean, if you plant them in the ground, rarely do they ever go wrong. Sometimes they can. But, you know, now we're dealing with a completely different animal. We're dealing with something that has to, you know, it, it comes off every year. Right. And so we were not experts ourselves, so we made a, a conscious decision that we wouldn't plant commercially until we found an expert. And so we set out to go across Central America, and fortunately we were able to find someone. In fact, we found a family that had been in the coconut world for about 20 years. Wow. They were in Nicaragua, but on the Atlantic side. And that operation was not active. It had been one that would, was active for a long time, but the, the, the father who started it after his wife died lost a little bit of passion for the area and had given up uh, the prospects of the, of the farm. But his, uh, his eldest son hadn't, and he had traveled to France. And France is a big coconut producer, but not in France. They produce all of their coconuts in India. But France has the uh, world's first uh, coconut certification standards. Um, you know, they've figured out the, the science of it all. And Leslie was the gentleman that we found who was the only certified coconut seed pollinator in all of Central America. So pure look, God brought someone to us. We wanted a plant, and so we hired Leslie. And Leslie planted for us in 2014 a test site of 350 acres. And we personally invested in coconuts in 2014. So we've grown rapidly since. We're actually in the middle of planting 10,000 acres of coconuts. It'll be a 1 million coconut tree farm when we're done with it. Wow. Well, uh, you know, as there are more and more uses for it, the demand has skyrocketed as, as the price. And, you know, you make the great comparison. If uh, people heard your last interview, uh, it's kind of a long-term investment when you buy lumber because it can take years and years till it's harvested. And then basically you cut it down. You have a great year that year from a cash flow perspective. And then you replant and you're going to harvest again in 20 years or some period of time. And that can work for a portion of people's portfolio. But this is a crop that uh, comes back every year. Yeah, that was the reason you know, we were looking for something, too. And, and having tried various uh, other crops, uh, they were just too touchy. Too, you know, they just weren't, you know, we wanted something strong. We're personally low-risk guys, you know, when it comes to investing. And so the coconut fit for that. And, of course, yes, it is an annually, uh, you know, it's an annual production tree. Now, it doesn't start producing normally. Uh, until year four. Now there's different varieties, different species of coconuts. You've got the little brown ones that grow on those very tall trees. You've probably seen some YouTube videos where they send monkeys up to the top of the trees. We're not growing those. We're growing the uh, lower version, the dwarf versions. They're the Malaysian uh, yellows or the Brazilian greens. They're the big ones. Uh, those trees get to probably 12, 15 feet at the highest. Uh, they start producing in year four, even though our trees from 2014 we have nuts on them right now. We're yeah. excited in January. We got a call from, from Leslie. He said, we have a spear. I go, okay, what's a spear? It's an arm that holds coconuts. And so, of course, we're, we're all excited. We've got these spears coming out of the trees. But, yeah, it's an annual, annual production tree. Starts producing generally, as I say, in year four, around about 50 nuts the first year from a tree. It should double its production in its second year, and then it becomes fully mature in year six. Okay. And an average coconut tree, if it's commercially grown, now listen, coconut trees can grow anywhere. You've seen them on the beaches of the world, yep. and they'll still make coconuts. Maybe they're not big, fat, sort of juicy coconuts from, those, uh, from the beaches of the world. But we're growing commercially. We're growing organically. We obviously found the greatest soil that you could find because you don't want it to be too sandy. You don't want it to be too, you know, too dry in the areas. It Coconut trees, they don't grow too well if it's too wet either. Uh, we've irrigated the plantation so that we have, uh, on our cycles, we have uh, uh, two cycles of, of weather. We obviously, most of the year is very wet, four months of the year is not. 
Um, but we've done it right. We've kind of babied each one of our little baby coconuts. I mean, Leslie personally uh, hand pollinates every one, and then we give each coconut its own bag to grow in. And it's about eight months before they go from a sapling into the field. But um, from an income standpoint, for those of us that like regular income, you were talking earlier on the show about real estate, traditional real estate, and having a nice rental income. I look at the coconut as my rental property. I actually do look at it now, to be honest with you, as, as an agricultural annuity. Because the one thing about a coconut tree is she'll give you nuts for 60 years. Well, that was going to be my next question, is if you start in year three and you uh, you ramp up production till year six, how long does the, does the coconut tree produce? That's a long time. It's a long time, yeah. On um, an average of maybe 150 nuts for about 45, 50 years. And so today's prices of coconuts, you've seen them in the store at 2 and $3 each. We don't get anywhere near that at the farm. Right. It's around 25 to 30 cents, 35 cents maybe for an extra large coconut. But, you know, if you're pumping off, if a tree's pumping off 150 nuts every single year, that's $45, $50 a tree, and we plant them uh, 100 trees per acre. So that's $4,500, $5,000 an acre. That's not bad for farming, right? Well, and let's talk about the farming part of it, because the way that you've designed this from an investor's point of view they don't have to learn how to farm. They don't have to figure out coconut science. They don't have to find their own Leslie. Instead, they come alongside what you guys are doing. They own the real estate. You guys farm the coconuts. Yeah, the investor side of our company is one in which happened to us rather than us focusing on it. What I mean by that is people saw what we were doing. Uh, people, you know, talked to us about what we're doing personally and asked if they could be involved too. And that was several years ago. Um, and the more people learn about our coconut uh, plantation and our coconut business, uh, they've, they've asked us if they can join too. So we have set about the last two years making a percentage of what we plant in our, you know, in our, our ground available to private ownerships. But we work strictly with accredited investors. I believe this space is just as risky as any other space. I mean, there's nothing that's, you know, nirvana. I mean, it's, it's called investing, let's face it. Right. And sometimes things go right and some things sometimes go, go wrong. Uh, but the coconut's a pretty strong, hardy tree. Um, as long as it's uh, it's not overwatered and it's long, as long as it, uh, it gets a lot of sunshine, you know, you're not going to grow a, a coconut tree in, uh, in Denmark, for example. It's too cold. It's a nice additional diversification for a real estate uh, investor's portfolio? Well, there's a couple of ways it diversifies. First of all, obviously, agriculture is different than anything else someone might invest in, but it's also geographic diversification. If all you own is property in a single country, this is a way to diversify that way. What about currency? How does that, does that affect it in any way? Uh, where we are, it's all dollarized, even though the country has its own currency, but everyone in business, in fact, everyone that I've seen for the last 17 years there uses the dollar. We operate in dollars, and so everything that we buy and sell is in dollars. So with regards to currency, you know, it's, it's the U.S. dollar. And then you've got a group of people who will come together, and they'll buy a certain amount of land. How does that work? Is the land deeded? Is it part of a private placement? What's the investment side? Like? Yeah, so we do two things, Robert. We have a fee simple deeded approach because I'm a real estate guy. I like to own the dirt and that's why we chose Nicaragua and the certain countries in, in Central America. There's a lot of places in the world that can grow coconuts. Philippines, for example, great place, but you cannot own the dirt. Right. And being a real estate investor, if it's in my name and it's in, you know, I look at look at the deed and I see my name on the deed, I'm comfortable. I, not that I, you know, have anything against partners, but I just feel more comfortable when the deed's in my name. So sure. that's that's one way that we do it. So inside of our registered plantations, all of our plantations are registered in the local country. Inside there, we subdivide parcels and then individually deed those parcels to the clients. And you have to fit for us and we have to fit for you. What I mean by that is we're not just taking on people so that we can grow the company larger and larger and larger. Even though we'd like to do that because we're very passionate about creating more and more jobs, but we believe this space is only for someone that has patience, understands the illiquidity side of things, because a lot of investors, and listen, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, a lot of investors don't have patience. They want to be able to quickly get out of stuff when things go wrong. This isn't easy to get out of. I mean, who in the world is, is going to just quickly come to you and buy your coconuts from you? Right. Not, it's like, not like a condominium. The other way we work is we put together a U.S. domiciled registered SEC fund. 
And in the fund, there are three components to that. Coconuts are one of them, coffee and timber. So there's a blended, it's a blended approach so that you can get early income from the coffee, additional income from the coconuts, and what I call the lottery winnings returns, because, you know, when you harvest a tree that was a little sapling and it became a huge log, there's quite a volume increase there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, it's good stuff. We're talking about investing in coconuts and obviously other agricultural items, and uh, we've got lots more of that as we come back. Plus, we're going to play Real Estate Trivia next. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys Radio Program. I'm your host, Robert Elms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. This portion of the Real Estate Guys radio program is brought to you by International Coffee Farms, where you can own a parcel of land in your very own specialty coffee farm in Panama for as little as $15,000. Here's how it works. Deeded half-acre parcels entitled Specialty Coffee Farms in Boquete, Panama, are turnkey managed professionally on your behalf by a team of local experts. Sustainable average income is estimated at 12%, and cash flow can begin within 12 to 15 months from the date of your parcel ownership. International Coffee Farms' mission is to own and operate specialty coffee farms that are economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. As part of this mission, 20% of the gross profits of each farm is committed to a socially sustainable fund to improve the lives of the Panamanian coffee farm workers and their families. International Coffee Farms currently owns and operates nine specialty coffee farms with half-acre parcels available for immediate ownership. To find out how you can become a coffee farm owner in Boquete, Panama, email coffee at realestateguysradio.com. That's coffee at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Patrick Donahoe, CEO of Paradigm Life. Wall Street and banks spend billions of dollars per year in advertising with the goal to convince you that they are the solution. But take a look around. None of their advice has worked. If you're listening to this, odds are pretty good that you're already a real estate investor or at least becoming one. So why do you do it? Is it to hedge inflation, the tax benefits, or maybe it's to get your money away from Wall Street? It's because of these benefits and so many more that I created the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy. When you combine successful real estate investing with the Perpetual Wealth Strategy, you have the recipe for what has helped the wealthy to establish their financial well-being for decades. You can download the Real Estate Investor's Guide to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy today by clicking the Resources tab on the Real Estate Guys Radio homepage. Don't wait. Go download it now. Hi, this is Lawrence. You are Chief Economist with National Association of Realtors, and you are listening to the Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show today. We're talking coconuts and interesting agricultural investment. Before we get back to our interview with Alex Wilson, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing something about coconuts. Well, it's a coconut real estate trivia question, and, and we've asked a couple of those before, so this one's different may take a little research on your part, but it'll be worth it because if you're the first person with the right answer, you're going to win a copy of Passionistas, Tips, Tales, and Tweetables from Women Pursuing Their Dreams. A great little book can be yours if you know today's real estate trivia question. Last week on The Real Estate Guys, we were talking about alternative financing sources for real estate investing. We asked this, which U.S. city has the most tennis courts per capita? Well, the answer is Chicago, Illinois. With 26 times more tennis courts per capita than the city in the U.S. with the lowest number, that's Gilbert, Arizona. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. We're talking coconuts. Here's what I want to know. Where in the world is the Coconut Research Institute? Also known, by the way, as the National Coconut Research Institute. If you know or want to take a guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, your mailing address, and the answer to the question. For the winner, you're going to get a copy of Passionistas, Tips, Tales, and Tweetables from Women Pursuing Their Dreams. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking about agricultural real estate where your tenants are trees. We've got Alex Wilson with us from Precious Timber. And, of course, we've had you on the show before, and we've had lots of folks interested in that. And I know that listeners have invested in the timber side of your business. But the coconut side, even though you've been doing it for a few years, you had to test the market, make sure it would work, get some growth happening, and then obviously the plan now is to increase that. And so talk about your typical investor, the, the kind of person that this makes sense to, because it's not for everybody. 
Yeah, you're right. And thank you, yeah, because um, some of your audience have done exactly the process. We start with an educational site. It's not about um, saying, hey, one size fits all and this is the price and if you can afford it, then you can join us. Right. We don't really approach it that way. We first ask, what are you trying to accomplish financially? And when would you like to accomplish it? And is there a space there where you and I may be able to work together? Because as we said, this is something that's not familiar. And even though we know when we go to the supermarket, there's fruits and vegetables, and we look on the label, and most of those things are grown in Central America to begin with. Yeah. But I, you know, it's we're not familiar with it from an investment sort of asset space or something in the portfolio. So that takes an education. And so what I like to do is I like to not put people on the spot, but take them back to school and say, look, if you're going to learn about this to the degree where you can make an intelligent, informed investment decision, let me help you do that. Yeah. Not let me sell you on it, but let me help you do it. And so I'll provide any amount of information for someone to personally do the work. And they, I know if they've done the work or not because they come back with great questions, and a lot of your audience have. And then the next thing for me is once they've done that, please come down. Join us on one of our tours. We have scheduled tours where there's a small group, six, eight, ten people, or just come down any time. We, you know, my partner lives there permanently. I'm there every single month. Come down, visit us, meet the people that are going to do the work for you. Well, this is critical. You know, we really appreciate the fact that uh, we've known each other quite a few years. We keep seeing each other in the same places. We've been able to watch you guys kind of evolve in your business. We've met your partner. Uh, but we have had folks come down and go on the tour and come back and say, well, you got to see it with your own eyes. That's pretty good advice. If you're just a passive real estate investor and you think, yeah, I'm just going to mail some money off to Nicaragua, well, that may be a way to go, but I think much better to, as we would say, kick the dirt to see what the operation is like. And that's going to be a great way to learn it. Get educated ahead of time and then kick the tires, I guess. Yeah, I think that's how I am. I mean, I want to do business with someone that's doing the same business. I mean, I don't want to be, you know, the first guy that he takes on. So everybody works differently, of course. But I'm, I feel more comfortable accepting a client if I know they've put the work in, they've visited us. They've done the necessary things so that they can convince me that it is the right thing for them. I don't know whether that makes sense, but that's the way I work. Well, actually, it makes a ton of sense. And one of the things I wanted to ask you about is we get questions, and we had an Ask the Guy question a few months ago about this very thing. How does somebody vet this kind of a thing? So I know you get a chance to get out and look at a lot of other farm type operations and so on and for the investor that's going to make this kind of a decision and get educated what are the things they should look out for what are kind of the red flags yeah um first and foremost we're talking about real estate okay so make sure they own it i mean if they say they own it they should be able to show you a deed right with their name on or the company name on that's number one. Second of all what experience do they have you can always hire great people I mean, we've had to do that, hire great people, because Ken and I were not agriculturally educated, but we've learned over the years. Obviously, they've taught us, and it's nice to be taught from people that have done it you know, since day one. They've been generationally passed on. But take a look. Do they have things that are actually growing, too? I mean, are things, you know, and is it, you know, anything can be staged. So talk to the locals. You know, if you talk to the people that own the local restaurant or talk to the person that runs the local, you know, hotel, find out about the people that you're doing business in and how they are, you know, regarded in the community, for example. So those are the, one of the ways, especially if you're dealing with U.S. clients. That's why we decided, and most of our clients like to own the dirt, but many people said, I don't feel comfortable owning real estate in another part of the world, but I still am intrigued and and interested in the agricultural space. So we went ahead and looked at the law. And the law says if you're managing other people's money, even though it may be in the agricultural space and it's pooled together where the returns come from not just that person's plot, it's considered a security. Right. So are they registered? Did they go to the lengths to actually go through the scrutiny that the SEC puts you through? and then go register it and spend the you know the, the many, many thousands of dollars with attorneys to make sure that it's done right. So that's, those are just things that I think are not done often enough, and I wish they were done more. The other thing for us is we only work with accredited investors. 
uh, we believe the space really isn't a good fit unless you're accredited and an investor. Well, you know, and previously, I think 10 years ago, it probably wasn't a good fit unless you had a whole bunch of money because there's just so much to the operation. But this is now a place where you could come alongside and be involved. Let's talk about things like your minimum investment and how long someone should be thinking in terms of an investment like this. Because you talked about liquidity or lack thereof. Is this a one and done, keep it forever, or is there a market eventually? Well, there is a market. Um, I'm generally trepidatious to take on a client that's thinking that way unless they can convince me. Remember, I'm asking them to do some research and some homework, and then oh, likewise, I'm willing to do that on, on my side. Um, but if you're buying into our farms, we're building this business and putting this whole thing together for primarily longevity. This is going to be a generational thing for, for me and my family. You know, we promise a lot of things. Our employees are not promised a job this week and next week. They're promised career-type positions so that they can do the things that maybe some of us take for granted. They can save. They can go on vacation. They can send their kids to college. So it's tough for me to take on someone that might be only interested in, in handling it for a year or two or three because Jose has to get hired you know, in, in our operation for a long term. Um, the other thing also, too, is it, it, you're not going to really earn anything of any significance if you're holding it short, short term. I mean, you know, you've got to, you know, this, is, this is stuff that, you know, it takes a while for the larger return on investments to come. I mean, it takes, what, eight years, ten years just to get your money back from coconuts. Now, of course, the land's appreciating at a long time. If you can hold it for 20 or 30 or 40, and that depends on the age. I mean, I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. I mean, those coconut trees, they're going to be they're going to be in their teenage years when you and I are ready to say, hey. But no, I mean, for me, long term is, is I'm not saying it's, the, it, it's an absolute, but it's best fits for us and it best fits for the client if they understand that you get the most benefit if you hold it longer. Sure, absolutely. But at the same time, it could be a great investment to keep in your family for generations to come. Well, it is. It's a legacy play. I mean, uh, for, for those uh, investors that have families, you know, you got kids, and then maybe you're going to have grandchildren, and then they're going to have children. So these coconut trees are going to be around for a long time. And then, of course, the, once they're 60, 65 years of age, the, the, the lumber from the coconut is very valuable. Wonderful. It's, just be it's a beautiful texture wood. And then do you replant? You, re you would replant. Absolutely, yeah. you would replant. Okay, excellent. And then let's talk about this. I know if you uh, are looking at, depending on which side of the investment, either a fund, you've probably got a minimum there. And if I'm going to buy parcels, what does that look like? Yeah, so if you're buying parcels, our minimum is 100000 Okay. And that buys you six acres of planted coconuts. Okay. Uh, that's very important. Right. Now, I'm going to plant them in the next two years. Already planted. Planted coconuts. Yes, yes. In the fund, we have a $50,000 units, and we generally like two unit minimums. Okay. So 100000 is basically our entry level position. And then what would you say your average investment looks like? I know there's always the minimum, but I know you've talked about folks that have come in with a few million dollars. What's kind of an average investment? I would say for someone that has done their homework, that has convinced themselves beyond a shadow of a doubt of a few things. Number one, this is mother nature that's creating the dollars here. This is biological profits, which a lot of investors are not familiar with at all. Profits normally come from buying something at one price and selling it to someone else at a higher price. Sure. This is very different. So the average investment when someone does that homework is around 250. Okay, so 100000 on the minimum. Uh, you probably are going to look at whether or not it makes sense for a person to own the real estate themselves or be part of the fund because of diversification there and so forth. Once I invest, what else is there for me to do? Anything? I just sit back and let it grow? Yeah, because the way we packaged it, the purchase price, whether it be in the fund or uh, Fee Simple, it's packaged with all of the registration. It's packaged with all of the labor costs uh, in. It's packaged with... Um, the ongoing crop care. And so really the only thing you have to do is, you know, come down and take a picture uh, as often as you wish. In fact, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get it all uh, digitized with 
you know, cameras up, up there so you could actually show your friend at home. But no, there's not, really not much to do. Uh, obviously, a lot of our investors invest in their self-directed IRA. So once a year, you have to give your custodian, you know, what the value is of that. But really, not a whole lot to do afterwards. Uh, the agricultural stuff, that's what they're there for. There you go. All right. Well, this has been fascinating stuff. Lots of uses for coconuts. And, you know, again, you, I know you're going to urge people to do their homework if they reach out to you. But check out what the uh, variety of possible outcomes is and the length of life of the crop. That's another thing to look at. Right? So much we could talk about. But actually, Alex put together a great report for you. If you want to learn more about it and get his contact information, all you have to do is send an email to coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. Coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. Uh, what's in the report, Alex? Uh, we've got a lot of stuff in the report. We were, uh, I start by basically the history of the coconut, how the islanders have used coconuts for generations, and it's an amazing you know, component to their daily life, all the way through to today, where there's hundreds, as I said, of different products. And the other thing it'll tell you is the actual supply-demand factors that are at play right now. I mean, there's a, a huge drive for demand, and coconuts, the ones that are produced across the world that are supporting the demand, they're all generally uh, of the older variety. Those trees are 50 and 60 years of age, so there's going to be a little crush here. I mean, we're using millions, trillions of coconuts. Maybe 10 years from now, I see some price changes. All right. Well, good to know. Well, we appreciate uh, you making that to be on the show again, and uh, thanks for the great information. Oh, no. Thank you so much. There's Alex Wilson. Again, his report by sending an email to coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. Just like his crop, our show is growing in its listenership, and we're going to have more on that when we come back. Return to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Frank by Forbes is one of the fastest growing cities. Orlando, Florida has a big and diverse economy, yet still features affordable rental properties that cash flow. Our boots on the ground turnkey provider Greg Bond at Greater Orlando Homebuyers can show you how to start generating cash flow today. He just wrote a special report to help you discover the magical market of Orlando. Request your free copy today. Send an email to Orlando at realestateguysradio.com. That's Orlando at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, I'm Aaron Katusa, the chairman of Katusa Research. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. Hey, come hang out with The Real Estate Guys. We're all over the place. You can find out where by going to realestateguysradio.com and clicking on the tab that says events. Some of those are events we do and some of those are events we show up at. And either way, come on out and let's have a beer. Talking to coconuts today and agriculture, always fun to get around Alex Wilson. Yeah, you know, it's really been fun getting to know Alex over the years. We've been out on the trade show circuit. You know, you and I cover a lot of trade shows, and we always see Alex there and been watching him and uh, asking. You know, you always ask around, you know, because we all kind of live in this little world, and uh, he's always had a good reputation. And then the whole timber thing was fascinating, and I remember doing that show and how fascinating it was to me. But, you know, that long-term thing, I get it, but it's not for everybody. Right. And the coconut thing is personally very fascinating. You know, I'm addicted to coconut oil. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What I never really understood or appreciated about coconuts is the vast, diverse number of uses, how many different things that you can do with coconuts. And the other thing I really like about it is the durability of the crop. Because, yeah. you know, one thing, when you're growing a fragile crop, you've got the danger of losing value in the shipping and the storage and things like that. But the coconut is very durable. It can travel all over the world. 
And so I like that part of it too. And then, and then the speed at which these trees grow and how quickly they start generating cash, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, absolutely it is. And, you know, again, this kind of investment is not your middle-of-the-road investment and probably not a good first investment. But for someone looking to diversify and still be in a real asset, Agriculture checks a lot of boxes. Well, I, I mean, as I said at the top of the show, I think it makes a lot of sense at a strategic level. It's the reason sovereign nations, especially ones that have long viewpoints, are, are grabbing up agricultural resources and mining resources around the world. They see, as I said, what Chris Martinson sees, that we are a world of finite resources, and so uh, those resources will probably become of greater value as more and more people are competing for them. And uh, when you look at something like a coconut that, as I mentioned, has so many diverse uses, so many reasons people would want it, uh, I think that that makes a, a lot of sense. The other thing I think that's great about it being income, you know, that concept that Alex brought up about the idea of this being a legacy or a generational asset, I really like that when you incorporate it into some of the things you can do from an estate planning point of view. You know, there's many times where people who are putting together an estate plan, maybe they want to give a gift to uh, their university or a charity of some sort, or maybe they want to create some structure of income that will support their family or somehow take care of some need that they have. They don't want to give people control of the asset. They want to give them the benefit of the income. The challenge is, is that certain assets like an apartment building or a home, I mean, it'll have value for a long time, but eventually it, it doesn't because eventually it, it wears out. And you think about something like agricultural, how long plants have been growing on the earth. I think that's probably going to keep going on for a while. Yeah, right. yeah, you know, so you, the idea that you could say, okay, I'm going to, you know, I die and I'm going to leave a million or two million or five million or whatever the number is, and I just go buy a chunk of land that is producing and pledge the stream of income to whoever or whatever it is that I want to support, kind of that endowment or that annuity thing. And uh, that just popped into my mind as I was listening to him talk because that's a problem a lot of people are always trying to solve. Well, do you want to leave your teenager $2 million? or a stream of income of, you know, $5,500 a month. Well, it's not just the income. It's the, it's the difficulty in liquidating it. You put that out there and say, oh, that's a negative. It's not highly liquid. That can be a positive. Yeah. That can be a positive because it's not easily disposed of. You know, there are certain things I do even with liquid wealth. I, I mean, personally, you know, it's easy. If I take a bunch of cash out of the bank and, or have cash reserves, I could just go spend that money. It's easy. But if I buy precious metals, there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. It, it, it gives me a more disciplined savings type of program. This isn't, of course, a savings, but this is more of an investment. But it's an investment that isn't easily sold or exited. And because of that barrier to entry, may be less likely. And, of course, the other thing is the nature of the income itself is far more stable. The demand for the coconut may go up or down. But the actual growth of the, the commodity the trees don't care what the interest rates are. The trees don't care what the political climate is. The trees don't care if there's wars or rumors of wars. They don't care. They just grow. And at whatever point down the road that you harvest, that crop has a degree of relative value to whatever is going on in the world. And again, when you look at the idea of things like food and, and uh, the various uses for a coconut uh, in particular, it's probable that there will always be some level of demand, which means there will always be some level of income available for the crop, and that crop will hold its relative value no matter what happens to the currencies or systems of government. So well, I you think, can't think of too many other crops that have so many different uses, and they're finding more every day, not less. That's what's intriguing to me. It's not like, well, okay, it's the, it's the, the rage right now is coconut water. That could go away and in two years. It's something else. Well, that's true. But meanwhile, there's more than 100 other uses for the product, so that's pretty awesome about that. I mean, there's obviously no one-size-fits-all investment of any kind. When it comes to agriculture, lots of things to think about, but there aren't too many places that individual investors with a few hundred thousand dollars can play in the, in the agricultural space. Well, that's what I love about the way the folks that we have been able to uh, get to know have put together their agricultural offerings, you know, for the most part. Now, Alex has got a higher level than some of the other folks, but uh, at the end of the day, still, it's within spitting distance of someone who's trying to manage a, a sizable portfolio. If I was inclined to go buy an apartment building, I'm probably going to have to put at least $250,000 in, Yeah, right, if you think about it. So at the end of the day, it's really not that much money. And the other thing is it could be a good place to park equity. I mean, if, if I've got a bunch of equity in an appreciated market and I could access it, maybe I just want to 
take it and move it offshore. Maybe I just want to take it and put it into something that would be very difficult for a predator to come take from me. Uh, so there's an, uh, there's an asset protection and estate planning component. There's this legacy endowment generational wealth component. Of course, there's how it fits in in your portfolio for what you're trying to accomplish in terms of mid-range cash flow or long-term equity growth. Uh, there's speculating, if you will, on the changing conditions of what's going on in the world with currencies and population versus uh, global resources. So there's a lot of ways this thing can fit in. It isn't a one-size-fits-all. You have to think about what you're trying to accomplish in your personal financial portfolio and your personal financial life, but it is really a, a pretty diverse asset or investment, and it can fit into your portfolio and your plans in a lot of different ways. If you want to learn more, all you have to do is send an email to coconuts at realestateguysradio.com. And if you think that $100,000 would be hard to swing, well, then maybe you want to syndicate the money to learn how to do that. Coming out to the secrets of successful syndication, which is just the idea of pulling resources from multiple investors to go do something bigger and, of course, bigger profits. Looking forward to another great event. It happens in September in Dallas, Texas. All the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. Big thanks to Alex Wilson for enlightening us about coconuts. And until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at BeYourBank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers. Low cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct. Asset protection strategies for real estate investors. From attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys radio show.